talks about how he's um, saved our, my soul. And I just I wanted to share my testimony and um, how I got saved. Um, uh, one day my mom was mopping and she said, don't, don't get out of the chair because the floor is wet. And I decided to get out of the chair and step on the wet floor. <laughs> and so she took me to the back and she um, spanked me and she said, <laughs> the, re um, the, the reason why I spanked you is because that was sin. And because you stepped on the floor and I told you not to. And she said, um, Jesus died for that sin, and it's all it's all gone now.
Okay. Oh, you can tell where he's born, right? <laughs> uh, all right. I always say I was, oh, I was southern bred, but I'm northern fed. You know, people around here like Texas Pete, but I like Tabasco sauce because northerners like Tabasco sauce. And so, anyway, oh. Um, well, let's uh, turn to Joshua, right? We're kind of going to take a little break from Matthew. I was going to, you know, I, I, I am trying to preach through the Bible, but sometimes when the Lord says no, you got to do what he says. You know, I had this whole thing uh, ready to go, and, and uh, then the Lord said no, I, I want you to talk about something different. And so, uh, so let me... Uh, Sure, I got the right, the right one here. Um, okay, so Joshua chapter one, and I just want to kind of just uh, the title of the message uh, is just when it couldn't get worse. You ever, you ever been there? <laughs> uh, we're looking at a story of a man who really we're gonna. I, I don't know. I'm, it depends on how the Lord leads. Uh, may just uh, finish tonight as well, uh, but uh, because of some things that Joshua didn't complete, the world's still struggling with it, and uh, uh, things left undone will never go away. So it's uh, it's something to consider. Joshua was a good man, but you know he may not have realized it. But there are certain things Joshua failed to do in his life, and while he was a, a great man of the faith. Um, he he still did not do everything that that God had told him to do. I don't know what the reasons were necessarily. I just know that God said take it all, <laughs> and there were a few places that were left. And so um, I think that it's safe to say that the one in the wrong would have been the one who didn't do what God said. So, um, but anyway, Joshua was still an amazing character in the Bible, a man that I aspire to, to be like. His name is actually Jesus in the, um, in the Hebrew. Uh, Yeshua uh, is, is what they would call Jesus in, um, in, in the Hebrew. Jesus is a Greek version of, uh, of, of his name. Uh, but we definitely see a lot, of, a lot of Jesus in this story, the battles that he faced. And, uh, but uh, but anyway, let's let's look at uh, verse one here. I, I hope that that this story will uh, kind of uh, just help you in your life personally. Uh, there's a lot of turmoil going on in the world today. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of a, a lot of epistemological thinking. I know it's a big word, but what I mean by that is there's a lot of a lot of influencing things that are that that people have been taught, raised up to believe. And as a result, uh, they're getting the Bible mixed up with their own personal convictions, battles that they face personally. You know, in the very same way that America tends to think at times by, uh, by false preachers uh, who say that you can get health, wealth, and prosperity by serving the Lord. Uh, you know, uh, that's not biblical. That's actually reserved for Israel. Uh, in that very same light, there's a lot of countries who believe that Palestine has been wronged, and the reason why they believe that is because uh, they look at their own battles that they've fought against uh, countries that have uh, that have oppressed them, and uh, how they've fought and won their territory. And when they see uh, they see Palestine uh, crying out for justice, that Gaza has been taken from them. Uh, well, God commanded Israel to take Gaza. <laughs> if that makes anybody mad on the internet, uh, talk to God about it. It's right here in the Bible. Uh, God said to take Gaza, and uh, there's just a, a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of disagreements and friction that's going on. Um, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, you know, a country that I love dearly, of course, you know, I have a great heart for Ireland. Uh, the Irish are very torn to pieces about this whole thing. Um, and, you know, they, uh, 
they they're angry because Israel will not give Palestine their Gaza. Uh, you know, and uh, while I don't believe in any form of bloodshed, I don't, I don't believe that there ought to be bloodshed on either side of the camp. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is Gaza belongs to Israel. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, something that God himself declared. It's right here in Joshua. Um, so, you know, there's just a whole lot of things that, that are going on. Uh, you know, they, they were oppressed by the English for many years. Uh, when the famine hit, the English decided, well, we'll just encroach in on Ireland and we'll dissolve the Irish and turn them into the English. And so they really took advantage of the famine and uh, forbade the teaching of the Irish language. And they, they, uh, they, would, they paid the teachers not to do that. They would uh, ship all the good staples out of the country. The only thing they let the Irish eat were the potatoes. And so when that famine took place with potatoes, potatoes was the only thing that, that, was, that went bad in Ireland. When that went bad, the, unfortunately, the foreigners came over and they said, well, we'll just take advantage of this. And if you study the history of it, you'll know they were really greatly oppressed. And I think that a lot of what happened in their past, I think it's affecting them as they watch what's happening in the Middle East. Oh. But again, when you, when you take something that's ordained by God, you have to understand it's, it's not for everybody. Uh, when God said, I will bless you, I will bless you with health. I mean, this is literally what he's saying in a short version. Health, wealth, prosperity, children, bumper crops. He was talking to Israel. So when you hear a preacher say, this is what the Bible says. If you do what God tells you to do, you'll get health, wealth, and prosperity. That was reserved for the, the, the that was reserved for Israel, all right? Now, he does give blessings to those who draw an eye to him. The principle is still the same, but there's different blessings that we can receive by drawing closer to the Lord. Uh, but, uh, you know, we can't get that mixed up. That's really what ultimately causes friction. A lot of people say, well, it's satanic. Well, I do believe that the devil has something to do with it, but I believe also that there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of confusion that he likes to stir up. And I think that there are actually people who are very sincere and, uh, and, and mean well when they take a stand for Palestine. And when you look at it from the outside and you don't know the story and the background, the history, you do tend to feel pity for the Palestinians. Uh, but you have to understand that it's, uh, you know, the, the, also it's important to understand too that when, when Jesus comes back, he's going to take his, his bride home. You know, Israel's still going to be in the world and they're still going to need to repent just like the rest of the world is going to need to repent. Uh, you know, uh, of all the people that we ought to be saying shame on you to would be the Jews. They crucified Jesus. <laughs> I mean, the king of the Jews here. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is they are God's people. It's so, so important for us to keep that in mind. And uh, so if, you ever, if, if our country ever rises up against Israel, we should be concerned. We really should. But I love Israel and I support them because God has chosen them. And without them, we would not have this. <laughs> oh, well, I don't agree with everything that's going on and it's, it's hard. When you, when you actually look into everything that's going on over there, it is very, you know, especially if, you're, especially if you have not been well taught, it's a very difficult thing to decide which side you're going to be on, especially when all of your friends are supporting somebody that the Bible says you ought not to support, but it seems like everybody else does, and they have good explanations for it. Uh, we ought to have some pity on the, on the people who, who are on the regular residents of Europe and just understand that they are greatly misled in a lot of ways. But Israel's not doing everything right. I think that we can all agree with that. Um, you know, I, I don't think that uh, some of their retaliation measures are good, but they're God's people, and we need to pray for the whole situation, the mess that they're in. But uh, let's look back at, uh, at the, the uh, inception of all of this stuff that's going on today. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... 
came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. Now, I want you to just notice, all right, that it says that uh, Moses, the servant of the Lord. And then you have Joshua, who was Moses' servant. Now, I want you to notice what the Lord says about Moses. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore rise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. <laughs> Don't go the conservative route. Don't go the liberal route. Don't go for the pro-Palestine. Don't go for the pro-Israel. You go for what God said. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Uh, Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law, shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and have a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And so we have Joshua going, okay, he turns around and he starts telling the people what to do. You can tell this guy, you don't see a lot of emotions in the Bible. You can kind of tell this guy's a little bit scared. Because when he, uh, when he goes and begins to talk to the people, uh, you begin to notice later um, in the scriptures that the people encourage Joshua. Hey, look, pal, I just want to let you know, you look a little shaky there. Be strong and have a good courage. This is the very same thing. This is the very same thing that God said. They, they come up to Joshua. You can read it in, in this passage right here. They come up to him and they say, hey, Joshua, I just want to let you know we're with you. We've been through some stuff and, you know, we've made some bad decisions and we've kind of learned our lesson. I miss Moses too, but I just want you to know we're with you. We're behind you. And uh, Joshua's like, Okay, I'm trying to trust the Lord here. He's scared, all right? Oh, the Lord tells him to be strong. The people tell him to be strong. You see, be strong all throughout this, uh, all throughout the story of Joshua. You know, Joshua's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You know, when God starts speaking, imagine you being Joshua. Joshua uh, God starts speaking, and you're waiting for the battle plan. Because the very first place that you have to conquer is that. Now, you don't have RPGs and hand grenades and pistols and, you know, M16s and all that other stuff. You don't have the, you don't have anything that we've got today. You don't have airplanes. You, you can't call in a, you can't call in an air defense force. You can't do anything. You just have something that a dead guy left behind that we're trusting God actually breathed on. <laughs> and 
and uh, so he, you got to remember too. Now, now this right here is translated. All right, we've we've had this. This is translated. God's word is inerrant, and sometimes in the Bible, you know, and I've, I've studied, I've studied into this. I've I've listened from teachers, and they've said, you know, God's inerrancy does not depend on whether a man translates it right or wrong. It's still an error. Now, I want to help you understand something. Joshua held in his, he might not have had the whole Bible, but he had, he had a scroll pinned down by the very hand of Moses. Imagine that. And so he didn't have to worry about it being falsified or twisted around or anything. And I'm not saying that this Bible, I'm not trying to say that our Bible is twisted around or has mistakes or anything like that. I'm not trying to say that at all. But I just want to help you understand that the, he has the original copy. So there is a lot to be said about that. But I think that Joshua was standing there listening to God speak. And I'm sure he's waiting for God to say, now there's a little hole in the wall on the other side of that big building. And if you can get to that wall and you can all manage to, to, you know, get in there and sneak through without anybody noticing, you'll probably be able to take that city, all right? I'm sure he was probably waiting for some sort of strategy. But God says, now Joshua, I'm going to tell you how to win this thing. You're everywhere, you, everywhere you put your foot, you're going to take it. All right, sounds good. So what's the battle plan? How's that going to happen? Stay in this book. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on a minute. This is not what the seals get taught. <laughs> this is not what this is not what you learn on Paris Island. Uh, this is not what you learn at West Point. What's going on? You know. Uh, you mean I got to stay in the book in order to do, in order to conquer that? Yeah, Joshua. <laughs> it just doesn't seem to. It doesn't seem to fit. God said it doesn't matter. I'm outside of all. You don't see the way I see. You're not me and I'm not you. You just follow me and you trust me and everything's going to be good. <laughs> and you know what Joshua said? He made a decision. He said, okay. You know, that's what we need to do. We need to say, okay. What if I fail? <laughs> Look, I'm going to tell you something right now before I go any further into this message. I'm going to tell you it's not about whether or not you're going to fail. It's about him succeeding. <laughs> He said, I will not fail. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with you failing. It has nothing to do with you doing something that you're not supposed to do. It has nothing to do with the mistakes that you make. If God's brought you to something, he's never going to fail you. But you have to decide that you're going to go forward and do it because he said, I am not going to fail you. It's important. <coughs> now I want you to just, uh, let's have a word of prayer. We're going to kind of Fast, we're going to rewind a little bit in, in the story, okay? Father, we just ask that you would help us as we look to your word and as we consider some of the things that Joshua had to face. We ask that you would help us to consider the predicament that we're in, some of the things that we might be facing in our personal lives, perhaps in our church, in our families, I don't know. Could be that we're, we're could be that somebody here is faced with some sort of a dilemma and they just don't even see any way around it. But Lord, I pray that you just help us to just glean a little bit from this story, that we might be able to trust you about what's before us. So help us, Lord. Lord, give us the courage, like Joshua. Lord, speak to our hearts. Be be strong. Just be strong. I'm with you. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to say okay and, and go forward and do it. And so it's in Christ's name we ask all these things. Amen. You know, God, God has put a pretty hefty task before us. He really has. You know, he, he's, uh, he's, he's called us to reach the world. Oh, uh, you know, I know that there are other people out there doing that. I just got a text from Harold Vaughn. He said, praise the Lord, we've had a two and a half hour service. The, the, the preaching ended and it's gone into prayer. And I was like, praise the Lord, where are you? And lo and behold, the word Lebanon came up in this passage. He's at Lebanon Baptist Church. <laughs> so, 
hey, they're conquering the territory somewhere, all right? And, uh, you know, God's doing things in other places, but right now, uh, the only place that he's concerned with is, is you. You know, he, he's, he's, he's telling you, hey, look, I know you got a daunting task, and you know, I know you're a little church, and it almost seems like it's, seems like there's no point to anything, but, hey, do you trust me? That's the question he's asking. All right, so um, I just want to kind of backtrack a little bit in the story um, and uh, just uh, just kind of uh, just kind of catch you up to speed here. Some of you remember uh, the story of Moses in the book of Numbers, um, and uh, I, I would like to turn there. Uh, You'll have to forgive me. I told you I had a whole outline of a, of a message, and the Lord said no. <laughs> and so I'm having to look these things up. Um, so let me let me find this really quick. Um, okay, let's see here. There we go. Turn to Numbers chapter 20. Okay, this is where technology is good. <laughs> now I know technology, 80% of it's bad, all right? 90% of it's bad. 10% of it can be good. And uh, I'm going to say 10% because the Lord expects us to give 10%, right? So I think the 10% of what man has done can go to the Lord and it'd be good, all right? So anyway, but I, I do think that uh, at times, you know, especially when a pastor's a... Uh, uh, trying to decide what in the world is he going to say now, you know, it tends to be a little bit helpful, but, uh, but uh, let's look over at Numbers uh, chapter 20, and I want us to just look at this story here. Of, uh, now, I want you to just imagine being Joshua, all right? Now, as this is getting ready to unfold, I want you to remember that Joshua has been wandering in the wilderness now for 40 years. Now, before that, Joshua was a faithful spy. Kids, you remember the song? Twelve men went to spy on Canaan, ten were bad, and two were good. Who were the two? Joshua and Caleb. I'm sorry. Miss Helen always used to say, Preacher, I am your Caleb. And you're my Joshua, and I'm ready to follow you. <laughs> and I miss her so very much. Oh, forgive me. Oh, uh, but Joshua and Caleb were the ones who took a stand, though everybody else turned against them. And because they didn't believe God, God made them wander in the wilderness for forty years. Now, I'm sure that Joshua. God promised. He made it very clear. Joshua, Caleb, you're going to see the land. The rest of these guys, they're not going to see it. He made it very clear that they were going to see that land. And so I'm sure that Joshua, he was okay with that. But I think after 40 years of complaining and bickering, watching people die in the wilderness of that generation that didn't believe God, I'm sure that Joshua was getting to a place where he was like, you know, I, I, I was faithful back then. I, I, I trusted God, you know, and uh, because these guys didn't, now i got to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And, uh, you know, it's a little frustrating. I'm sure there were times where he said to God, you know, Lord, I, I, I do believe your promises. I believe you got a future for me here. I believe you got something for me. But, man, I'll tell you what, I'm tired of having to suffer for these idiots. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But, I mean, uh, you know, you know, it's kind of like what uh, kind of we you know we made a few little recordings during COVID, a little cartoon of Bible characters, and Moses goes, "Lord, why do I got to keep working with these nuts and bolts?" You know, and I'm sure that Joshua felt the very same way. Lord, I just don't understand why I've had to go through this, and I can imagine him looking over at Caleb, and he's like, "Caleb, man, he's got one foot in the grave." And I'm sure that I look about as bad as he does. We're getting old. And I just don't understand why we got to go through this with these people. You know, I'm not saying that he had a 
full attitude like that. But I'm saying that as a human being, a man who struggles with light passions as we do, just like Elijah, I think we get a good look at Elijah's emotions more than any other man in the Bible. And I think that Elijah had some, I think he battled with things, you know. There are, you know, there, there are people who say, well, maybe Elijah's attitude was a little bit different. Maybe you need to look at it in a different light. I can understand that. I can understand that. Uh, but I do know, too, that Mike Barnett struggles with, with some things at times. And when I read in the Bible, it says Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. It says, hey, Mike, when you're feeling down, just understand Elijah felt the same way you did. So it helps, you know. I'd like to be able to think that Elijah wasn't really like that, but, you know, I, I, I just have to say, you know, Elijah was a human being, and we need to give all glory to God. And so I'm sure that Joshua might have had, this, had these questions. I mean, he had to have at least had it once within a 40-year period. And so he's, he's wandering, and, and, and uh, he's, 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 he's here in this story in Numbers chapter 20. And once again, look what it says, all right? Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. So Joshua, he watches Miriam pass away, and he's like, okay, well, boy, I'll tell you, she was a sweet lady, you know? I, 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 we're going to miss Miriam. Miriam was probably a good lady, you know? She, she was the one that made sure that Moses was taken care of. And so, you know, I'm sure this was a very difficult time for not only him, but the rest of uh, Israel. In verse 2 it says, And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And I'm sure Joshua was like, here we go again. <laughs> right? Um, so verse 3, And the people chode with Moses. I just don't understand why we got to keep doing this. I don't understand why God's got to get us to the point of death with thirst before he does anything. And they're griping and groaning, and Joshua's like, you know, you're still alive, aren't you? And, you know, I'm sure that there were probably some, 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 you know, some word matches with these people. And uh, so, verse 3, uh, the people choked with Moses and spake, saying, would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. That was the older generation. Basically, they're saying, we should have died with them. Why the Lord let us keep living? Joshua's like, oh man, I'll tell you, that was below the belt. I've had to wait for these people to fade away, and I've been faithful to God. How dare you talk? I'm sure that Joshua probably had some passions rising up in him. Verse 4, it says, And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, and Notice, take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. What did he say? Speak. Speak to the rock. Look, are you mad? Are you angry? Are you frustrated with the way things are going in your life? Speak to the rock. Okay? Are you, are, you, do you, are you faced with death? Do you have an illness? Do you have somebody that won't come to church with you? Do you have somebody that you wish would just join you to worship your Lord? Just speak to the rock. You know, it's important that we do this. You know, there, God just says, I just want you to speak to me. Speak to the rock. He's already been smitten, right? Moses smote him already. Jesus only gets smitten once, all right? So it's important that we speak to the rock, all right? So he says, speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. You know, God was always teaching a lesson. He wanted it to be done before the people. You know, why? Because the people needed to see a magic trick? No, that's not what it was. He said, speak to the rock before the people, because I want them to know that if they just ask me, and not complain and not try to figure out how to do things on their own, and, and not complain to you. They keep thinking you're the reason. I, I don't want them to think that. I want them to realize that I'm the one that sustained them. 
So Moses, I need you to do something for me. I need you to go out in front of all these people and I need you to, I need you to speak to the rock and I'm going to send water out of the rock so these people know that all they got to do is talk to me. I just want to, I just want friends. I just want people that love me, that will follow me, that will serve me. All they got to do is ask and it's theirs. They're my people. And so... Look what it says in verse 9. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Okay, now, before he, before he started reading, all right, Joshua was standing outside. He's probably, probably stayed pretty close to Moses the whole time. And, you know, he's frustrated. Here we go again. It's probably something he's used to after 40 years. And, and Moses comes out of the tent and he goes, you know, he, he, you know he, he comes out and he's like, okay, he's getting ready to speak to these people. He's getting ready to bring forth more water, you know, and all this stuff. And, and he says something different from what Joshua's used to. Notice what he says. Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Joshua's probably standing there wondering, whoa, whoa. God's the one that gives the water here. What are you, what are you doing, Moses? All right? And you got to remember, he's been waiting for 40 years. He's thinking, okay, God, you got you to help us here. Verse 11, and Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock. Now, it says twice. Now, I want you to understand. I don't think he just went like this. All right? I think he hit it the first time, and I think nothing happened. And I think Moses, in his rage, looked at that rock in fury, almost like a guy who's trying to get a car started, and it won't, after he took it to the mechanic, mind you. He looks at that rock, and he goes, come on, and he hits it again. Do you know why I picture that? Because Mike Barnett would have done that. <laughs> <laughs> My boys and my wife, they've seen me do it multiple times. It's amazing that my table is still intact, you know. I'm surprised I haven't split it in half yet. Harrison knows that, all right. He's seen my keyboard jump up off the table more than once, all right. I got a blue hot temper, I gotta admit it, you know. But, yeah, I'm sure he hit that rock, and as soon as he did, water started coming out. I'm sure Joshua was like, oh, God's all right with this, because this just ain't right. Something's not right about this. People drink. Now, all of a sudden, just when he thought it couldn't get any worse, he gets news that Moses is not going into the promised land. I want you to think about that. He's been waiting for 40 years, and he's been going, okay, Lord, I'm really ready to go into this promised land with Moses, my buddy. He's my mentor. I love him. I'm ready to go in. It's been 40 years. All of a sudden, what do you mean Moses isn't going into the promised land? You ever been there? You ever had one of those moments where you, where you, where you, just when you thought things couldn't get any worse, that the news that Moses isn't going to be able to enter the promised land, whatever your Moses might be, it turns out that it's, it's gone. Could be a death, could be the loss of a job, could be, could be a future that you thought was going to happen and it was canceled. What do you mean? And so fast forward, and we see Joshua's heart right now. Moses is dead. You know, this isn't how I have life pictured. I can't do this. I can't go into the promised land with these people. I've waited too long for this. Be strong, Joshua. Lord, why did it happen? I'm thankful, Lord, and I, I love you, and I want to serve you, but why did you take Moses? Why did you take that guy that I've been following this whole time? I remember when he came down from the mountain with those Ten Commandments and those people drove him to lunacy. Now, why did you take him? Be strong, Joshua. I 
will not mm -hmm. fail. Mm -hmm. It's not about us. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk to my boys right now as I, as I preach. Daddy's going to fail you. Mm -hmm. Moses let Joshua down, but that didn't stop Joshua. Joshua was probably a little upset about what was going on, but when God spoke to him, he said, Hey, my servant's dead. It's your turn now. I can't do it. It doesn't matter whether you can do it, Joshua. It's about me doing it. See? And then I'm just going to, really quick, I'm going to close. I'm going to fast forward to Joshua chapter 6 here. You want to see how scared Joshua was? You get a good, good picture. <coughs> that wall right there on the screen, you see. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And I love this. The Lord said unto who? Joshua. He looks at that wall. Okay, does that wall look like there's any way you can get in there? No, it doesn't look like it. But God goes, Look, Joshua, I've given you the city. <laughs> That's basically what that passage is saying. Joshua's like, okay. <laughs> he said, okay, what do I need to do, Lord? Of course, you know the rest of the story, right? And now you know the rest <laughs> of the story, right? <laughs> he gave them some crazy instructions, but they took that city, didn't they? Mm -hmm. You know God will not fail, but it's important that we do everything he tells us to do. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing. We're going to look a little bit into that tonight. I don't, I, the Lord has just kind of directed me in the area of Joshua. But uh, uh, we're going to look a little bit tonight at some things that Joshua didn't do. And uh, the world's paying for it today because of it. Lord, we just ask that you help us to, to always remember that you're there with us. Lord, sometimes I, I got to be honest, Lord. I'm, I'm not, this message was more, I think, probably more for me than for any other person in this church because there's, I got to be honest, Lord. I've got to be honest before, my, before these people, Lord, that you've done a few things I'm not so sure about. But, Lord, the promise is sure. I will not fail. And Jesus never fails. So Lord, would you just, I think, just as the church prayed in Acts, I think it was Acts chapter 4, God, would you give us courage yeah. to do what you told us to do? Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be strong and to obey you, to go forward Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Just for a moment, look, I want to just tell you. Joshua's an old guy when he's looking at these walls. I dare say Joshua might have been maybe in his 70s, maybe even in his 80s. It doesn't matter how strong or how old or whatever you are. It's not about you failing. It's about God succeeding. Mm -hmm. But the only way that'll happen is if you say... Yes, even if it looks impossible. Mm -hmm. So just determine that in your heart. Hey, Lord, you're never going to fail. So whatever you're facing right now, you know, uh, the chaos that we see from God's perspective is all perfectly planned out. The mess that we see over in Israel, Palestine, God's got it all figured out. So let's just remember that no matter how chaotic and messed up things might look, you say, Lord, you got this. I don't know how. I don't, I don't get it. It doesn't look like you got anything under control. But from what I hear, you got it all under control. A hundred percent. And I'm going to trust you a hundred percent. So Lord, I pray that you just work with us. Lord, help us to just keep these things in mind. And I thank you, Lord, for our people. Lord, thank you for thank you that the heat started coming on, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just
just a, a feel of the heat, Lord. I want to just thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that you're always in control. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, as we, as we trust you this week. In 